There are many approaches to take in discussing the subject of uh, prayer. Uh, we can talk about you know, how to pray uh, the Lord's Prayer, for example, in Matthew 6 and Luke 11, Jesus gives us a, a model that we can use uh, in, our, in our prayer life. Or we can study uh, the great prayers that are found in the book of Psalms, for example, or in the New Testament, especially in the book of John. Um, there are many examples of prayers there that uh, help us uh, to think about different things or different ideas, different ways to approach God in our personal prayer life. And then of course, we can study uh, the great uh, men and the women of prayer, especially uh, Jesus himself, uh, to uh, give us uh, ideas, uh, different things to pray about in order to round out a more perfect, a more complete, a more mature uh, prayer life. And so I believe that prayer is the thing that we need the most and we do the least. Uh, so we, before we study how to pray or who prayed or what they said, I think it's important uh, to establish uh, some reasons why we ought to pray, why we pray. Now, there are many reasons why we need to pray every single day. And I've simply chosen three uh, to share with you this morning. The first of which is to unburden our hearts of anxiety and the guilt that plagues us because of sin. All of us sin, all of us carry that burden of sin with us uh, each day. And prayer is uh, the antidote to that particular uh, burden that we have in our hearts. And I've asked uh, several brothers to uh, give us examples of prayer this morning. And so first we'll uh, begin with uh, Brother Joe Hammond and he will give us an example of a prayer of repentance and confession. Joe. Pray with me, please. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we come to you today in prayer, knowing we are not worthy, but ask for your continued mercy. We acknowledge that man is weak and sinful, and we do not des deserve your grace and mercy. You tell us in the word, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, and blessed is the man against whom you count no iniquity. Without you, Lord, we are nothing. The wisdom and comfort you give us is beyond measure. Knowing you are always there for us, even when we choose to fall away from you or continue our sinful ways is a true example of your wonderful mercy. We should take comfort today knowing no matter how long we have been gone, no matter how, no matter our sin, and no matter what, if we confess, you will guide us down the path of righteousness. For that, we thank you, Lord. I pray this in your son's name, amen. Thank you, Joe. It's an amazing, it is amazing rather that people will try everything under the sun to deal with their anxieties and fears. Drugs, self-help methods, escapist devices like, you know, uh, sleeping, eating, sex, before they finally come to God in prayer. Peter says, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I want you to notice that Peter doesn't say that we have to work out our problems and then give them to God for approval. Isn't that what we do? We try to figure things out, work things out, and then we give God the solution and maybe ask him to give us a stamp you know, of approval.
He says in this passage here, simply to take the burden off of your heart and give it to God. That's it. It sounds too simple. We haven't figured everything out. And yet the inspired apostle says, just give it to God. In not saying that this absolves us, or rather I'm not saying that this absolves us of the responsibility for our lives and our problems. However, through prayer, we can detach ourselves from the anxiety and the fear and the stress caused by these things. Prayer serves in the same way for the problems we have due to the sin in our lives. As Christians, we often sin and fail in living as we ought to live. As Christians, we're always you know, living under the burden of ought. I ought to do this, I ought to do that. I should be you know, at this level. We, we live under that, that burden. Why? Because we want perfection. That's why we want it. You know, people accuse us all the time. Well, you Christians, you, know, you think you're perfect. No, I don't think I'm perfect, but I'm trying to be. And that's the burden that I bear each day. I'm trying to be what, what, what God has asked me to be. Prayer is the starting point for dealing with the sin in our lives, the imperfections in our lives. Yes, we have to resist temptation, of course. We have to get help not to repeat sinful behavior, but as 1 John chapter 1, 8 and 9 tells us, the first action in combating sinfulness is to acknowledge it as such and appeal to God for help and forgiveness. Again, as John says, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, the reverse, the reverse of this is, is the truth. You know, we have to go to God and say, I'm a sinner, God. There are a lot of things wrong with me, Lord, and not be afraid to acknowledge the truth about ourselves. Then he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a promise, a promise made to those who have the courage to go before God and acknowledge their weakness. The problem is that we'd like to acknowledge our small weaknesses. You know, we'd like to acknowledge our clean weaknesses, you know. Well, you know, I got a bad temper and I lose my temper a little too quickly. Or, oh Lord, you know, I, I, I tend to criticize a little too much. I'm sorry about that. You know, those are easy ones. The, the hard ones are, Lord, I'm, I'm a liar. I realize that I lie way too much. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an honest person, God. I'm not honest with myself. I'm not honest with my spouse. I'm not honest in my business. I'm always cutting corners. That's hard to admit. Lord, I'm greedy. I never have enough. I want more all the time, no matter what I have. It, it's never enough. It doesn't satisfy me. That's hard to admit. It's a blow to our, to our pride, our sense, of, our sense of self. For the non-Christian, this is accomplished through baptism. Acts chapter two, verse 38, you know, we repent of our sins, we're baptized, God washes away our sins, cleanses us from all sin. But for those who are already Christians and continue the battle, the lifelong battle of sin, this is the way we deal with it. It's not complicated, it's not high theology, deep theology, it's pretty straightforward. God is saying to us, come to me and just tell me the truth about what's going on in your life and I'll forgive you. And he says, he'll be faithful to do it. What does that mean? It means that he'll be doing it over and over and over and over and over again. Why? Because we're repeat offenders, that's why. Every day we sin till the day we die. It's the burden we carry. It's the dichotomy of our, of our existence. We're Christians. We hunger and thirst 
to be right, to be perfect, uh, but we can't be. And that's a hard thing to live with. Prayer, prayer is the thing that enables us to live this life carrying this uh, burden. And so we need to pray because through the exercise of prayer, we leave with God the worry due to trials and the guilt due to sins. No other method is more effective to this end than prayer. Another reason why uh, we should pray. And that is we need to pray because prayer initiates spiritual and physical blessings for ourselves and for other people as well. I've asked uh, uh, Charlie Andrews to come and give us an example of a prayer of supplication, Charlie. Please pray with me. Father, you have been so good to us. Your generosity humbles us and overwhelms us. Thank you for giving us food when we hunger. Thank you for giving us water when we thirst. Thank you for giving us shelter when we are exposed. You are the God of manna in the wilderness. You are the God of victory in physical and spiritual warfare. And you are the God of salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ. Thank you for telling us in John that if we ask, we shall receive. Thank you for telling us that if we speak to you in prayer, you will hear our prayers and you will answer us, even if it's not the answer we want. Thank you so much for not giving us everything we want. And thank you so much for giving us absolutely everything we need. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to read a passage, a couple of passages that echo what has been said. Matthew 6, Jesus says, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. What a, what a simple and, and comforting passage. Jesus says to us, do not worry. Don't do that. And then he names the things that we worry about. What we'll eat, what we'll drink, what we'll wear. In other words, taking care of ourselves. As you get older, you know, when you're young and you're strong and you're healthy, you, know, ah, you can do anything, right? If this job goes, just go get another job. If this house burns down, ah, you'll just build another house. You know, you're strong. There's a lot ahead of you. You can do stuff. But as you get older, you realize you can't do everything that you used to do. You can barely do the things that you need to do now. And so you worry, who's going to take care of me? How will I be able to take care of me? You worry about things like that. And Jesus specifically says, don't worry. Why are you worrying? I know you're hungry when you're hungry. I know when you're thirsty. I know the things that you need and I know you worry about those things, but I'm telling you, don't worry about those things. And then he, he, he makes the comparison. He said, you, you shouldn't worry about these things because I'm going to take care of you and I'm promising that I will take care of you and all of your needs. And then he says, the non-believers, the Gentiles, that, that's who they are, the non-believers, they worry about those things. They chase those things. They focus on how to get those things and as much as they can, you know, as a hedge for the future. But you're not like that. You're not those people. You're my people and I will take care of you. And then in a companion verse in Matthew 7, 
He says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock, and it will be open to you. Again, the other half of that promise. I know what you need, just ask. And I will take, I will take care of you in all of these matters. So Jesus tells us that we should ask for the things we need and God who knows what we need will be happy to provide. He won't, he won't give us what we need begrudgingly. Oh, you again, brother. I answered your prayer yesterday. What do you want now? That's, that's us. That's not him. Our society prides itself on being independent. The self-made man or the self-made woman is admired and we strive to be fully self-sufficient or at least the dominant partner in any type of cooperative enterprise we under, undertake. It goes against our training, it goes against our history and our character to be dependent. Yet in reality, that's exactly what we really are. We are totally dependent on God. And the interesting thing is, that's the way he wants us to be. He wants us to be dependent on him. He's not like us, you know, we're parents, you know, you're 18, get a job, get out there, you know. <laughs> he's, not, he's not like that. Let's face it, God keeps the universe in order. He gives life and he rules over death. No one dies before their time. No one dies without God's knowledge and approval. No one dies alone because God is always there. From Adam to the last person born on this earth, all are dependent on God, whether they know it or not, whether they acknowledge it or not. The reality is we, we are dependent on God. And so prayer is our expression of dependence on God. You know, if you ask what is prayer, it's our expression of dependence on God. When I pray, I'm expressing my dependence on God. Just like baptism is our expression of faith in Christ, prayer is an expression of our dependence on God. We cannot think of or enumerate all the things that we need to live each day, but in prayer, we express our dependence on God for the ones we think of having confidence that he can and he will supply everything we need, whether we've thought of it or not. In addition to physical uh, things that we need, Prayer also is the way we access the spiritual blessings necessary for growth in the kingdom of God. In Ephesians chapter one, verse 15 to 18, Paul writes, for this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. This is a prayer for something spiritual. Paul is praying for his readers, uh, Christians, that God open their eyes, the eyes of their heart, the eyes of their mind, the eyes of their spirit, so that they will know the blessings awaiting them in heaven. We can't know these things unless God reveals them to us. And it's through prayer that God reveals the gifts that are waiting for us. 
There's no physical way to obtain these things. They are given based on a request through prayer. If we don't pray, we don't receive them. And so why pray? First, to unburden our hearts. Second, to show our dependence. And then thirdly, prayer is necessary because it is through prayer that we sanctify or we purify everything that we have in order to consume or to use it with a clear conscience and a joyful heart. And I've asked uh, Paul if he would come up and make a prayer uh, attuned to this idea, Paul. Will you pray with me? Holy Father and King, hallowed be thy name. You are the only true God. You are the great physician and the architect of this universe and of our lives. Your word was the beginning and all things were created through you. There is none holy like you no other rock so steadfast. You do not change from everlasting to everlasting. You are the same yesterday and today and forever. You are abundant in power and your understanding beyond any measure. You are the ultimate power in the universe. You can do all things. Lord, we fully we fully cannot understand the depths of your knowledge, your wisdom, or your power, but what you have revealed to us is beautiful, terrifying, and humbling. Father, we know that you are a jealous God, a consuming fire. We are so thankful that you are also gracious and rich in mercy, slow to anger, and not wanting to lose a single one of us. We know that your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules will endure forever. Out of your incredible love, you spoke the creation into existence, knowing that you would one day enter it and sacrifice yourself to save it. Lord, we're not equipped to understand your ways, for they truly are higher than our own. Lord, we exalt your name above all names. We praise the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and the head of our church. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who continues to help us and to abide with us to this day. For you are Adonai, you are Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, Emmanuel, and the Alpha and Omega. You fill all of heaven and all of earth and you uphold the universe. All glory, honor, and praise be your holy name forever. We offer this prayer of praise to you in your son's most precious name. Amen. In 1 Timothy chapter four, verses four and five, Paul, the apostle says, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Everything we pray for, everything we receive is sanctified by the word of God and prayer, he says. Is there anything in this world that is not imperfect because of sin? Are we not compromised in some way, no matter what we do? Do you ever think about that? Our taxes, for example, I don't just mean here, in any country, our taxes are used in many instances for ungodly things, which puts us in compliance with evil, unwillingly. The places that we work at may not do things in completely righteous ways, which force us to share in unrighteousness by association. Uh, what we consume as food or what we consume as ideas or entertainment is often tainted with worldliness and imperfection and sinfulness. 
our own motives in what we say and do, no matter how hard we try, are often mixed with pride, ignorance, lust. How can we survive in this world? How can we continue to live and breathe and consume the things of this place without violating our conscience day after day after day? We could never have peace of mind in any area if we did not have God's grace and could not express our gratitude and relief for this grace if it wasn't for prayer. Imagine if you will, God does not give us the avenue of prayer. Have you ever thought of that? Like there's still God, he still created us and he still told us what we should do but no praying, like go ahead and pray, but I'm not listening. Imagine that, how could, how could we live as believers without praying? Everything created by God is good. However, all good things have been flawed because of sin. And thankfully, all of these flawed things become acceptable through prayer and through thanksgiving. Why, do you think, you know, you're having your burger at McDonald's, you know, and you stop for a moment and you pray. I've often, you know, wondered if I should be praying for forgiveness <laughs> before I down that 2000 calories, uh, you know, heart clogging meal, you know, but we say, thank you. Why? Because through prayer, things are made acceptable. We can eat. We can live, we can breathe, we can go on. Without prayer, we remain in the world and we remain of the world and never rise above the world. But prayer sanctifies our lives. Prayer sanctifies the things that are given to us. Prayer enables us to live righteously in an unrighteous world. I believe that Jesus was a man of prayer because he understood the necessity of prayer within this context. Jesus was without sin personally, but he prayed often to unburden himself of the anxiety caused by his ministry. For example, in Matthew 14, 23, he prayed alone after feeding the 5,000. In Matthew 26, he prayed alone uh, his agony in the garden. In Luke 22, he prayed for Peter's ability to fight off Satan's temptation. Secondly, he understood the purpose of prayer. He understood the purpose of prayer in acknowledging the Father's role as the source of all blessings. In Matthew 14, 19, he prayed before multiplying the loaves and the fishes to feed the 5,000. He understood that it was the Father who was sending this miracle. And then thirdly, Jesus clothed himself with human flesh and became part of a sinful world. And what I mean by that is he paid taxes. He was part of the Jewish religion, which was ruled by, by hypocrites, but he nevertheless became part of this. However, he took ordinary bread and fruit of the vine and through his word and prayer, he established these emblems as holy remembrances of his death and burial and resurrection. We read that in Matthew 26, 26. We often wonder why Jesus, a divine being needed to pray. The answer is that it was Jesus' human nature that was active in prayer. Even if he was without sin and partook of a divine nature, he recognized the need of prayer as a human being. In dealing with the pressure and sin in this world, he prayed. In securing the blessings needed to survive in this world, he prayed. In making holy the things that were tainted by the curse of sin in this world, he prayed. I think we fail to have a satisfying and effective prayer life because we concentrate too much on the time 
or the regularity or the method of our prayers. Whoops, four o'clock's my prayer time. Oops, time to go to bed. The movie went a little long. Oh, wow, I'm falling asleep. But it's, it's, it's my prayer time because my prayer time is just before I go to sleep. So my prayer time, I've got to do it. Or it's the morning. So what do I do? Do I go for my run or I do my prayer time? Because my prayer time's in the morning. We focus a lot of our prayer energy on the time and the place. Focusing on these things does not move us to pray. Actually, it does the opposite. It makes prayer just another problem that we have to deal with because we quickly recognize how inconsistent and shallow we are in this particular area. Jesus did not have a regular quote prayer time or method. He used the avenue of prayer as the tool for communicating with God when dealing with stress or sinfulness or needs or thanksgiving. In other words, he prayed as these things came at him. In still other words, he prayed on the go. My wife is that type of person. She prays on the go, and I've mentioned this before, she prays for parking spots. And uh, I, thinking myself more mature in these things, used to laugh at her and say, well, stop, stop, you are, you're praying for a parking spot. Oh, oh, oh there's one right there. <laughs> So we, uh, we, can, we continue to, to have that debate, but that's what, that's what prayer on the go is. I need a parking spot. I hope there's one left, there's a sale and, and I'm, I've driven all the way downtown to get it. I, I hope there's one left, God, please. That's prayer on the go. It's not always for small things. Sometimes it's prayer on the go as you're on your way to the emergency room because your child, uh, no matter what age the child is, is, is there undergoing a, an emergency treatment. That's prayer on the go. Would you, wait, would you wait for your prayer time at 11 p.m. if you were in a situation like that? I remember uh, long ago, when, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but it fits. Um, well, our daughter uh, was on a holiday in Hawaii. She had called us the night before and told us that she and her friend Carrie uh, were going on a helicopter ride the next morning to, you know, to helicopter ride Hawaii, you know, see the islands and stuff like that. Well, that's great on the phone. And the next morning, as Lisa and I were leaving a hotel, because we were traveling in the United States at the time, um, I turned on the radio. Lisa had gone in to pay the hotel bill and I was waiting out in the car and I turned on the radio and the news was that a helicopter carrying two teenage girls from the United States had crashed that morning. And my prayer was not, dear Lord, it's me and I'm coming to you now and asking please, that, that wasn't my prayer. My prayer that morning was, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. That was my prayer. And thankfully, two hours later, I got a call and said, it's not us, we're okay. Unfortunately, it's two other young women who died and two other sets of parents who are suffering. But for this time, it wasn't us. But I remember the moment. In the same way, when we recognized the fact that we need to unburden our hearts of anxiety and guilt, we need to express our dependence on God, we need to purify ourselves in order to live in this fallen world, prayer is the method that God has given to us 
in accomplishing these things. And he gives us prayer so that we can use it anytime, anywhere, anyhow, any moment, any intensity for anything. Then and only then will prayer no longer be a forced habit sustained by willpower, but rather a natural function of our inner being powered directly by the Holy Spirit. As Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Imagine, in addition to giving us the avenue of prayer, God also gives us the Holy Spirit who will carry our prayers from our heart to his heart. I'd like to finish out a prayer and ask you to join me as I offer a prayer of invitation. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, you know the heart of every person here. You know who has not yet confessed their faith in Jesus Christ and been baptized as an open acknowledgement of his divine sonship and lordship. You know who is saved and who is lost. Father, you also know those Christians who are struggling with the burden of secret sin or blinding lust. You are intimately aware of those who are living double lives, who have not yet decided who they will serve, you or the God of this world and its false promise of security through wealth. And O oh Lord, you see all those who are suffering from broken hearts, loneliness, disappointment, fear of death and pain from both physical and emotional illness or distress. I pray in the name of Jesus that you send your Holy Spirit now to move any or all of these people to come for the witness of the church to their baptism or the prayers of the church to ease their pain. In Jesus name I ask, amen. I ask that no one be afraid or ashamed to answer the call that the Spirit has made this morning. Shall we stand and sing our song of invitation? <clears throat>